This video is part 2 of our deep dive into network theory. If you haven't watched part 1 yet, we strongly recommend starting there to understand the foundational concepts. In today's video we'll focus on the mathematics behind Bitcoin's network growth and find out what it will take to reach hyper-Bitcoinization. The paper on power law growth of social networks proposes generalized equations, one for nodes and one for links, that can represent various growth models for social networks, such as exponential growth, S-curves, power laws, and more, by simply adjusting the parameters. It also introduces a simulation method capable of identifying these parameters based on real-world data, specifically tracking the growth of nodes and links within a network. In every case studied, the results consistently pointed to power laws as the optimal solution for modeling network growth. Now let's delve a little deeper and unpack the logic behind these equations. At first glance, they might seem confusing and complex, but they become quite intuitive once broken down. And don't worry if some of the math is difficult to grasp, because we will also visualize the growth in an intuitive manner. The equation examines the relationship between addresses and time, serving as a representation of the adoption process. Let's highlight some of the parameters used in the first equation that represents the growth of nodes. N of t represents the number of addresses at a specific time, t. Beta is what we call the growth parameter. It influences how quickly the network grows. Theta is the temporal exponent, which affects how growth changes over time. And n is the potential maximum number of addresses the network could ever reach. dn over dt is the change of the nodes in time. In our case, we use days as our time frame, so dn over dt is the change in the number of Bitcoiners in a day. In a nutshell, this equation explains how a network grows over time, and in this case, we're using n to represent the number of nodes in the network. The left side of the equation shows us how much the network state has changed, or in other words, how much it's grown since the last measurement. What's interesting here is that this change is directly proportional to the current state of the network, meaning that the growth depends on how big the network already is. Therefore, we just take the previous value and add the change to get the new value. Think of this as an iterative process. Each step builds on the previous one, and the network keeps growing in relation to where it is at any given time. Now the way different growth patterns show up all comes down to one key parameter, theta. Let's break it down. If theta is zero, that means growth is constant. Theta to the power of zero is just one, which keeps the growth steady over time. This gives us what's called exponential growth. The network keeps expanding at the same steady rate without slowing down. When theta is equal to one, the growth follows a power law. Here, growth does slow down over time, but it's still significant. This is because the rate of growth is inversely tied to the network's age. So as the network gets older, it expands more slowly, but it keeps growing nonetheless. Now, when theta falls between 0 and 1, or goes above 1, we start to see different types of growth patterns. First, when theta is between 0 and 1, we get an S-curve. Growth starts off fast, but it slows as the network approaches a certain size, or saturation point. Alternatively, if theta is greater than 1, we see what's called the tapered power law, or Weibo model. Growth still slows down, but it does so even more than in a regular power law, and has a saturation point unlike a power law, which can keep growing. In all the real-world examples the researchers studied, they found that theta tended to stay close to 1. This suggests that a power law is the best way to describe network growth. In other words, the network grows quickly at first, but then gradually slows down over time in a predictable way. To summarize, the main idea of this equation is that we can use it as a dynamical process in a computer simulation, running it over and over again. Each day, there's a change in the number of nodes, and we can update the current state of the system by incorporating this change. There's also a similar but more complex equation that describes the growth of links, and in our case, the second equation represents the Bitcoin price that is proportional to the number of links. This equation depends on both the number of existing nodes and links. We're not going to dive into the details because it's a bit more complicated than the previous one. However, it's worth noting that alpha represents the average number of possible links each node has. 
the goal of the simulation is to create the best possible model by finding the values for beta, theta and n that best match the observed data. This is exactly how the authors were able to determine that all these real cases follow power laws. In our case, the beta values for Bitcoin are 3.17 for addresses, 1.77 for price versus addresses, and 5.65 for price versus time. As for theta, the value is simply 1 for all these relationships. Remember, in our case, we use addresses as a proxy for nodes and price for links. The relationship between price and addresses is called densification. We then ran the simulation iteratively to find the best possible match for the growth of this data system. And just like in the case of the social networks studied in the article, it turns out that Bitcoin also follows a power law. What other useful information can we extract by using this approach? Well, it turns out that the end parameter from the simulation is so big that it means that we're far away from saturation, or in other words, there's still plenty of growth left for Bitcoin. So, we now have one approach that focuses on the network properties of Bitcoin and another one that is simply a regression. These are two very different yet equally valid ways to arrive at the same result. Bitcoin follows a power law. Finally, let's visualize the growth of the Bitcoin network to show you what this really means. Allow us to simplify Bitcoiners as proportional to the number of addresses. Day 1 it all starts with Satoshi sending Bitcoin version 0.1 to the cryptography mailing list, introducing three people to Bitcoin by the end of day one. To calculate how many new Bitcoiners are added each day, we use a simple rule. We multiply the number three by the total number of Bitcoiners and divide it by the current day number. Since it's day one, dividing by one doesn't change anything. So we end up with three new Bitcoiners. By the way, who do you think this user is? Well, it's the legendary Hal Finney, who played a big part in Bitcoin's early history. He also made the first Bitcoin transaction with Satoshi, creating the first link. Now for the other links. The calculation is more complicated, but we're going to simplify it by using the limit case for a large number of nodes, according to which the links are equal to the square of the nodes. Therefore, the number of links is 16. On day 2, we start with 3 new Bitcoiners plus Satoshi himself from day 1, so a total of 4. Following the same rule, we multiply 3 by the total number of Bitcoiners, which is 4, and then divide it by the current day number, which is 2. This gives us 6 new Bitcoiners. Adding those to our previous total, we now have 10 Bitcoiners altogether. Now again, when using the simplification of links proportional to the square of the nodes, we have 100 links. That's a big leap, as everyone in the network connects with everyone else. Now it's day 3 and we begin with 10 Bitcoiners. To find out how many Bitcoiners join, we multiply 3 by 10 and divide it by 3. The result? 10 new Bitcoiners. Adding them to our total, we now have 20 Bitcoiners. The links grow even faster. By using the same formula as before and incorporating 20 Bitcoiners, we have 400 links between them. That's a massive network in just 3 days. Remember the price of Bitcoin is proportional to the number of links, so a small change in Bitcoiners gives us a huge change in price. It is worth noting that in the real Bitcoin network, there wasn't a real price associated with Bitcoin yet, but we can still think of a corresponding monetary value for the network given that people gave time, attention and mining resources to it. On day 4, we start with 20 Bitcoiners. This time, we multiply 3 by 20 and divide it by 4, giving us 15 new Bitcoiners. Adding them to the group, we now have 35 Bitcoiners in total. The number of links grows even more dramatically, bringing us to a whopping 1225 links. You might notice that we're only showing some of the possible links, otherwise the entire screen would already be covered by them. And there you have it, the growth of Bitcoiners and their links over just 4 days. It's a powerful example of how networks expand, starting from just a few people. Even though this growth might seem exponential at first, it is actually slowing down, thanks to the 1 over t part of our simulation. This curbing mechanism is innate to the power law, and the change in Bitcoiners really just boils down to 3 multiplied by the number of Bitcoiners divided by the age of the system, or the number of days since the Genesis block. Alongside the growth of Bitcoiners, the mining machines that secure the network also scale up. 
This is because the hash rate grows according to the power law, following a relationship with the price of Bitcoin. This is expressed as the hash rate is proportional to the square of the price. All these growth patterns, Bitcoin adoption, network links, and hash rates are connected through power laws that reinforce each other in iterative loops. The entire system scales proportionally, exhibiting scale invariance. Here is the final equation that ties everything together. Value is proportional to the number of links, which is proportional to the square of the number of nodes. This is also proportional to time cubed, squared again, meaning time to the power of 6. This equation captures the relationship between value, adoption and time, emphasizing Bitcoin's growth as a self-reinforcing, iterative process governed by power laws. To summarize, the growth of the social network makes the price go up, which means that the value of this system is actually in the links. The value does not necessarily equate to monetary value at first, but they do eventually become related. When people in the past described the geocentric model, it had to be made more and more complicated over time, thanks to the accumulating problems that emerged thanks to the faulty premise. The truth is usually much more simple and beautiful. When drawing parallels to our model, our idea simplifies everything and its conclusion is much more positive than some kind of greedy fight over scarce resources. Instead, it is all about participation and cooperation. The value of the network is directly tied to how many of us there are and how well connected we are. This is a scale invariant network. Right now, we have 16 years of Bitcoin's history. According to our price model, we will reach $10 million in 21 years. That would imply a market cap of more than $100 trillion, which would be equivalent to the value of all the real estate in the world. We don't think many people would disagree with our assessment that this would be the point of hyper-Bitcoinization. You might think that this is impossible due to Earth's limited population. Even if we use the most conservative estimate of 50 million Bitcoiners, it would still be unfeasible to increase the number of Bitcoiners by more than 100 times, because it would be equivalent to the entire population of Earth. However, here is where the beauty of our power law theory comes into play. The relationship between adoption and price is non-linear. Since the price is proportional to the square of the number of nodes, in our case the address is proportional to the number of Bitcoiners, a price of $10 million represents a 100x increase relative to the current price. However, the number of nodes needed would grow only by the square root of this, or about a 10x increase. Instead of requiring everyone in the world to join us, we only need to orange pill 10 times our current user base or around 500 million people. Once this much more realistic number is reached, Bitcoin would become too significant to ignore, even by nations. At that point, such a high valuation would likely trigger events leading to large nation states to fully adopt Bitcoin, establishing it as the monetary standard. Suddenly, the entire world would embrace Bitcoin. This is also when the power law story of Bitcoin adoption and growth would end and the new chapter in human history would begin. This is Saverio speaking, and as always, thanks for watching.